thanks, Matt. So, uh, firstly, I'd really like to just say thanks for organising this whole thing. Uh, I can imagine that it is a lot of work and, yeah, but it's, I think it's been really rewarding for the community, the worldwide Gamelan community to come together in this way. And so, yeah, thanks a lot for organising it. And thanks, Michael, for um, coming up with the idea for this particular set of presentations. So, um, moving right on into it. Um, so, I'm going to be talking specifically about um, Alit's piece, Genetic, um, which was composed in 2011 and 2012 um, and recorded on a CD in about 2015. Um, ooh, hang on, there we go. Um, so just a little bit of context, I think um, uh, Matt covered a little bit of this already, but specifically to my piece, um, uh, yeah, Alit was born in 73, but uh, even though he was a founding member in Suramani, in the mid 2000s, he stepped away and started his own group, Gamlan Salukat, which is pictured alongside. Um, and they have a sort of flexible membership of about 20 to 30 people and currently have a very unconventional tuning system, um, which I'll talk a little, little bit more about in just a second. Um, and it's primarily comprised of young musicians, which are kind of, kind of constantly refreshed new generations all the time. Um, and they are primarily focused on performing contemporary and experimental works. Um, and Alit has now written kind of several albums worth of new works for the ensemble. Uh, but uh, as well as that, they've collaborated with um, in international groups such as um, uh, Bang On A Can and Evan Zipperin. Um, and yeah, so Genetic was composed for the second tuning of Salakat's instruments, which I'll talk a little bit more about now. So um, the historical precedent for Gamelan Salakat is kind of in a big long history of uh, a big lineage of bronze instruments that, you know, a general trend of which is, you know, old instruments have seven tones and then towards the start of the 20th century, um, favoring five tone instruments. And since then, it, we've kind of been going back the other way again. And so Smarandana, which was invented in the uh, 80s by Juan Barato, um, has a sort of hybrid system where half, the, the lower half of the instrument is uh, slesir, uh, similar to a kibya ensemble, um, but the upper half, the upper octave is um, Saipitu, which um, offers itself as a way of playing smart Bulingan repertoire, Gumbul repertoire, and um, yeah, all the styles that use seven tone tunings. And this is the tuning that uh, uh, Suramani has. It's a Smarandana ensemble. Um, and Alip told me that before he started Saluka, he was actually experimenting with adding the extra notes on into the Smarandana instruments of Suramani. Um, especially he added extra bonang and pinchon into uh, the rayong and trompong, allowing him to have a sort of free seven tone, uh, you know, un unrestricted by octaves, which the, the gangsas have this restriction of only having sai pitu for the upper octave. Um, and I think uh, a strong motivation for creating Salukat was to um, expand the instruments further, allowing, you know, sai pitu or um, Pelog for Javanese musicians in both octaves. Um, and this, this has allowed him to, you know, compose very free seven tone melodies, kind of un, unconstrained by the, the Balinese modal system um, as it traditionally stood. Um, so getting into genetic, um, I'll read a little bit from the essay that Pete Steele, who spoke earlier in the week, um, translated kindly. Um, the idea began through my own intellectual explorations concerning the relationship and influence of genetics in creating natural and sustainable change from generation to generation. The forms that support new life are often considered, first considered destructive, but then later revolutionize existing frameworks with new forms and attitudes in a process of transformation. And I think uh, there were, thinks of his music and Gamalan Salukat as that is as the mutation 
by which revolutionary changes to gamelan music might occur. Um, and although actually his, his first album released with Salakat is called Gamelan Evolusi. Uh, so I think he was already thinking of like this prior to genetic, which is very specifically about um, evolution, uh, hence its title, which relates to genetics. Um, and the piece takes ideas from genetics both uh, literally and abstractly. So, um, so yeah, it, conceptually the piece is about the fundamental building blocks of gamelan music, looking at their core elements and trying to, you know, look at them under a microscope. Um, and, but then also how they evolve over time. Uh, and similar to the way the four nucleotides, G, T, C, and A from genetics can be assembled in countless combinations to create the building blocks of organic cells in you know, our own bodies. Uh, genetics musical material likewise is modular and he uses these chunks of material uh, and recombines them, reconfigures them in many different ways, uh, each creating a different um, character or orchestrational effect. Um, and even more literally, perhaps, um, he also uses the instruments as an analog, creating melodies that have this double helix shape, as you can see quite clearly here in the um, Sonic Visualizer demo, you can see that fairly clear DNA double helix shape running through there. Um, and he does this uh, particular uh, helix melody uh, using two pungles on the Jublag and Jagogan, uh, which start on their out outmost keys and work towards the centre pitch and then expand back out again. Um, and yeah, I think that's only one of the many unconventional performance te techniques in the piece. Um, and I think genetic is a very special piece. And for me, uh, every time I listen to it, new and clever nuances become apparent and its expressive power still really strikes me. Um, so talking a bit about the musician's perspective, and although I only have fairly limited anecdotal evidence of this, um, yeah, it's, it's very fascinating to think about it from this perspective. So um, as I mentioned earlier, because the uh, instruments allow for completely unrestricted seven tone melodic exploration um, that that poses particular challenges to the musicians. And as Wayne notes in his article, which he mentioned earlier in the week, um, it, the, the Bali solfege, uh, ding dong ding boom dang, uh, provides a clear orientation within the mode. So, and if, if the, the various seven tone melodies in genetic because they're outside of that um, five-tone territory where the solfege is, is best suited, that made uh, learning the melodies of genetic um, very difficult for the musicians um, because a core part of their learning practice is to be able to sing melodies using that solfege, dingo um, ben And although there is an adapted sort of seven-tone solfege, which I'll talk about later, um, I think it was already unfamiliar that enough that 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 wasn't as useful as it maybe looks. Um, so a little uh, quote from Alit here. Um, I just imagined the melody when I was composing it. The sound wasn't clear to me in my ear. And then I just taught it to them, the musicians. Even I got confused. The musicians, they just remembered the note, the keys. Uh, it's very hard for them to memorize at first because they couldn't understand where the melody was going yet and the sound is new, but then later they can hear the melody. Um, so I'll just play a very small excerpt. It's, it's a very long piece, it's over half an hour long. Um, so I'm only giving you very, scratching the surface of all the possible things I could talk about. But just before we listen briefly to a small excerpt, um, since the recording of genetic, um, the instruments have been retuned. Uh, so the piece can't be performed again unless someone builds new instruments that are capable of the same things as genetic. Um, uh, and even the CD recording, which is what we're listening to from as you entered the Zoom room, but also in the second now, um, the CD recording kind of fails to capture all the beating effects created by the instruments as a result of their tuning as well. So 
and, and the combination of notes, uh, which is quite unconventional, and the gongs are uh, quite and an intense sound, I think, would have been created uh, when hearing this live. And Alit has said that uh, I, he doesn't think the, the CD recording, it's so good that <laughs> it doesn't show you what it was really like to hear the piece, which was perhaps far more complicated than the CD recording makes it sound. Um, and to clarify, I'm, I've notated the whole piece in Western notation. Um, and I used uh, Alit's own notation for the piece as a guide. Um, but I think since he wrote it, um, decisions were made in the in the learning process that um, you know changed a few elements of the piece. Um, and because the the most likely form that you are to hear the piece is from the recording, my transcription attempts to compromise between Alit's intentionality in his score, but also the decisions they made in the process of learning the piece. So hopefully that compromise is clear. Um, so the specific part of uh, genetic we're going to look at, as it's like 31 minutes long, uh, we're going to take a look in Gen 4. Gen is short for gene, and he uses these genes as a, a, a way of referring to the stru broader structure of the piece, and they're kind of like movements. So Gen 4 is the fourth movement of the piece, um, and we're going to listen to just this small, like, two or three minute excerpt here, uh, which is the fourth and fifth subsections within Gen 4. And from the little essay he wrote on it, uh, his idea with this piece was to, uh, with this section of the piece, sorry, uh, was to connect various sai into a single continuous melodic phrase played by various instruments. Each phrase is made up of elemental motifs which together comprise the entire form. So let's listen now. <laughs>
So that's just, sorry. That's just a small taste of the fourth section of the piece. <clears throat> um, and that's the focus, that's the focus I'm going to take today, just of that section of the piece, because there's so much to talk about. And, but I think this section best sort of uh, shows his development relative to what um, Pete and Wayne were talking about earlier in the week. Um, so this is just a little structural diagram of the, the sections. So we, we had only the fourth and fifth subsection. So this column and this column. And these columns represent um, bars of, uh, sorry, nine bars of 18.4. Um, and the letters here represent material blocks. Um, and so you, you can see how in each column, sim simultaneously you're hearing different combinations of material modules, um, which creates a you know, wide variety of moods and textures. Um, so, the kandang here in, in the whole piece, there, there are two drummers, but they're playing four drums, as in charuwara, which Pete still talk about. Um, and they play throughout this entire section of the piece, they just play the same nine bar pattern five times over. <clears throat> uh, and this kind of links the sections together. And the general dramatic arc of the work is of, uh, starting at low intensity, um, building in tempo and density until the start of the next subsection, uh, where the gong releases and dissipates the energy that was built up. Um, and uh, as we'll talk about in a second, it's, it's, it's polyphonic, it's polytonal, polyrhythmic, and every instrument is in its own, its own mode. Um, so as I promised earlier, that we're gonna talk a little bit about Balinese modes, just for clarity here. <clears throat> um, this is the Balinese modal system according to Diwali. Um, this is the, the way he refers to the modes in the score of his piece. Um, and yeah, when, when I've asked him about it before, this is the diagram that he gives me. Um, but if anyone, anyone here who knows anything about Balinese music knows that there's no consistent terminology and uh, that's a fact of life. But this is what we're using today. Um, so... Uh, the modes Slisir, Tumbung, and Sunaren are, are pretty common. You hear them very frequently in uh, Smapagulingan uh, Smap repertoire. And Slisir was the mode used um, primarily on Gongbyar instruments. Um, and in early experimentation by Alit uh, on Sudamani's instruments, as um, uh, Wayne was talking about, uh, Slender Alit and Slender Gung. Uh, I used a fair bit in that piece. Um, but the final two modes on the list don't have very conventional naming systems in any, by any means. So um, these names kind of Alit has chosen um, just to use for his own purpose, but they were inspired by the, mo the, the names for modes that some Gongwang musicians use, um, Waragasari and Kartika. Um, but uh, Gongwang musicians, when they use those, names might not be necessarily referring to the same uh, note, uh, the same set of set of pitches, sorry. Um, and yeah, as I said, the terminology differences vary widely. So this is only, you know, one way of talking about the Balinese modes. Um, but yeah, the, the pentatonic, this pentatonic framework uh, is really stretched to its extremes in Gen 4. Um, so uh, when we were listening to Wayne's talk earlier, he was talking about uh, how Alit was layering, you know, sometimes three modes at once. In the final two sections of Gen 4, uh, Alit is laying five modes at once. So uh, it's, it's quite a kaleidoscopic <laughs> modal experience uh, hearing so many modes at once. Um, and yeah, he he's basically assigns each instrument one mode for the entire um, uh, of the entirety of Gen 4, and then uh, they stick to that mode uh, for that, uh, yeah, for, for that time, except for the Suling and the Dublag, which change. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, you talking about modes in specific, uh, the five modes, because we're hearing them simultaneously, but we're hearing sort of little different echoes of one or another at different times, 
uh, it creates this kind of modal conversation where different modes are highlighted at different times, creating illusions and connotations through the qualities of each mode. So you sometimes hear a little snippet of slender or lit and think, oh, think of Gendar Wayang perhaps or Ang Plung music. And then you hear a bit of Tumbong and think of Smart Guling on repertoire. Or that, that's the kind of experience that I have when I listen to this piece. It's a, you're hearing all these different echoes layering around. Um, but additionally, it's as well as polytonal, uh, it's polyrhythmic. Uh, and this is something that um, Pete talked a fair bit about with Charawara. Um, here, we're, we've got this framework of an 18 beat measure. Um, but within that, there's lots of room for uh, divisional ambiguity, which is quite interesting. So in this particular excerpt, bar 156, um, the Chigogan part is dividing 18 into three six beat groups, while the Pamade is dividing 18 into nine two beat groups. Uh, and then the Dublag is uh, dividing 18 into 12 one and a half beat groups. You can see here the dotted, um, dotted quarter notes. Uh, and then the Kantalan part has this sort of irregular group of, uh, sort of groupings of uh, three, three, two and a half, three, three, two and a half, and then one and a half to finish the bar off. Um, and then meanwhile, the Riong and Suling have a, you know, just a sort of another contrapuntal layer, um, not particularly uh, rhythmically, uh, yeah, it's just kind of through composed rhythm. Um, and then the Kandang is playing its pattern. Um, but the, this sort of layering is, it creates a strong tension, rhythmic tension, because um, things are going in and out of phase with each other. Um, and then at the point on the next downbeat, uh, where the gong lands, uh, it's this massive release of energy, um, which is very satisfying to listen to. Um, but I, I think comparing this to say other pieces of his, which um, this kind of polyrhythmic layering has become quite a trademark for Olit. Um, this, this is particularly uh, interesting because each, each part is highly melodic. Um, as well as being yeah rhythmically interesting. So let's listen to this small excerpt. <laughs> So yeah, you can hear how everything aligns at that point. It's a quite a... Um, so talking a bit about polyphony now, um, in, in Gen 4, uh, we're hearing as many as five independent uh, layers of melody, with the drum part adding a sixth level of uh, complexity. Um, so in this diagram, I've shown uh, different instances of the ensemble and the way that it's interacting. Um, and yeah, this is showing how the, the parts are kind of echoing around the ensemble and, uh, it, yeah, that's quite an interesting experience for the, as a polyphonic experience. Um, so colors represent different sort of related parts. So for example, the Kantilan and Pamade up here, they, um, are playing in sort of call and response with each other, you know, sort of in a little dialogue, they're interacting. Um, and then, yeah, the arrows show where they're, they're kind of calling and responding to each other. Um, so, but in this excerpt specifically, there are four, essentially four melodic strands, um, and they have like, different pairs, the Kantilan and Pamane, as I mentioned, but also the Blag and Jagog, which sort of, yeah, have another sort of call and response thing. They're filling in each other's gaps. Um, and in the second half of measure 177, uh, the Pamade is in close synchrony with the Kandang, but then in bar 178, the Rayong takes over this role. So we can see how the, the, the way the instruments are sort of forming a pair with one instrument, but then switching to pairing with another instrument, yeah, creates a really kind of interesting dynamic ensemble experience. Um, and Alit says that this kind of ensemble interaction was uh, partly inspired by the way the instruments and their parts interact and intertwine in the music of Gamelan Gambang and Gong Luang. So let's listen to this little excerpt. <laughs> Uh, 
another interesting connection just here while I, I notice it. Um, the the kandang has this uh, repeat, repetitive um, rhythmic thing, which is probably quite related to tihai from Indian music. Uh, and I think uh, um, Michael is going to talk about that shortly with Mundu um, um, uh, So just to tie it off here, um, genetic uh, to me represents a significant expansion and development of con conventional Balinese gamelan forms. And so I think I think Alit is is right in thinking of his music as this sort of mutation that's going to trigger uh, change within the broader context of gamelan music. Um, and uh, yeah, I think he's, 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 he demonstrates consummate control over his, over the musical elements. And that shows that, you know, he, he's the master of his Balinese identity, but also not constrained by it. Um, and, uh, yeah, genetic as well is so rich with conceptual depth, as I've, I've been explaining, um, which I think opens up a new way to appreciate Gamelot music from perhaps an intellectual point of view. Um, and I think that that it opens up an important new context for music in a rapidly changing Balinese society. Um, but as well as that, it, it makes it of interest to scholars and composers like myself. Um, so yeah, that's my presentation. I hope you enjoy it. I think we're gonna do questions now. Thanks so much, Oscar. Yeah, if, if anybody has any questions, if you would like to jump into the chat box. Um, we will call on you in the order that you would like to ask a question. Uh, if I can start asking questions if you have. Absolutely. Um, hey, Oscar, can you um, yep. stop your share? Yeah, sure. It's, uh, it's me, Sumar Sam. Hi, Sumar Sam. Uh, I, uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, great talk and uh, listening to uh, great music from Tiva Alit. Uh, I'm interested in this idea of a uh, melody. It's, yeah. uh, it's, I'm listening from the beginning of that genetic and it seems to me it would be difficult to find what is the, the melody of the beginning of the piece because to me it, that was um, the sort of the Maxim, maximizing the use of pengembang and pengisap and in order to uh, achieve maximal uh, omba. And I, so how that melody fit into that, as well as the, the band that we just listening, uh, uh, if there's a melody, there will be many melodies because it's different section, there's different model system and different things. So you mentioning about Model conversation. Uh, yeah. so I would like to. Uh, can you elaborate on these two things? In particular, it's just the concept of melody that the reality has in mind. Sure. Um, well, just to clarify, when you mentioned the start of the piece, did you mean you listen to it in your own time and listen to the very beginning? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the very beginning uh, is is intended to explore the the interesting tuning of the instruments I think and uh, Alit uses a term uh, well he's he, it's part of part of a broader thing he calls concept bunyi but um, it's yeah he's exploring the kind of the core sonorities of his instruments um, and so I, I do, at that point I in that opening section I, I don't think there is a melody very clearly and I, I don't think that's necessarily what it's about it's it's about yeah, exploring the, the the sound of the instruments just on their own, um, aside from the melodies they they can produce. Um, but I think uh, then, yeah, that that fourth section, which I was talking about today, is highly melodically focused. Um, so I think yeah, he's demonstrating that he can do both. <laughs> he can do the experimental, listen to the omba, you know, focus on that kind of thing. But also he can he can write a really good melody um, and. But yeah, also, of course, in the fourth section, we're hearing, you know, as many as about five different melodies at once. Um, so it's, it's a lot of melody. <laughs> yeah, anything else you'd like to say? Oh, yeah, so how, do, uh, how does he transfer the piece to the seasons? It's written uh, with a particular melody or? 
yeah yeah it's it's all it's all pre-written melodies um he's he he teaches it to them like maguru bhangal style <laughs> uh he just teaches it to them like that mm-hmm. i i think in some parts of genetic he was using uh he's using ding dong ding dong dong to teach teach it to them but um perhaps only in the parts that are like like this part of the piece where it's clearly that it's clear that an instrument is in fact in a mode um but there are plenty of parts of the piece that are just free seven tone and kind of and that's what um Alec was saying in his quote uh in the middle of my presentation i'll just jump back to it um yeah he was saying that yeah he just uh he even got confused when he was teaching it to them um because the sound wasn't clear to him because it wasn't in that uh you know five tone realm it, uh so yeah it was very hard for the musicians to memorize uh because they they couldn't sort of hear clearly where the melody was going um but you know then they just learnt it sort of by rote and then the the melody emerged from that i think Thank you. Thank you, Samosa. Oscar, I actually have a question for you. Yeah, um, I think so Jody's got a chat as well. But. As somebody who's um, not super familiar with like performance practice in Bali, I, I, I found it fascinating that you know this piece can't actually be played again until there's a gamelan that can be retuned. So can you, can you tell me a little bit about like the context for the performances that this piece was when it was written, like what kind of performances were these, uh, what what was this composition performed at? Is this something that gets toured around Bali? Is it performed just for the recording, et cetera? Um, I know that, uh, actually, I'll admit actually that I have never heard Genetic Live, which I, (laughs) despite being extraordinarily obsessed with the piece, I think that's, I, I wish I could have heard it live. Um, perhaps Michael can speak up here because he has heard it live. Um, I know that there were sort of con- uh, performances just, uh, you know, just to the general public. They they weren't in the context of a temple ceremony or something. And I, I'm quite sure that Genetic wasn't performed at, say, the Bali Arts Festival. I think they were just, you know, more intimate perf- size performances than that. Um, yeah. Michael, I don't know if you want to step in. Um. Somebody can help me here. There's a there's a new music venue now. Well, not oh. just new. Rebentarabudaya. Uh, Rebentarabudaya in the in the village of Ketewell. and uh, there's a small but you know uh, important festival context or concert performance context, um, which lets music and some other composers who are prominent within Bali now and also from outside uh, get their music played. And I saw Genetic. Oh, sorry, Oscar corrected me. Elit actually pronounces it genetic, not genetic. Uh, but I, anyway, um, I saw it performed in 2013 and uh, it was quite uh, unforgettable because of the long, slow uh, music at the beginning of the piece, especially uh, when uh, Elit has actually specified the length of these long pauses and has the musicians count them in their breathing. So you have uh, them physically demonstrating the inhale and exhale by expanding and contracting their chests all in a group as they count to these slow 15 beat rhythms that separate the individual uh, you know, events in that opening section from one another. And to watch this whole group breathing together was uh, one of the most um, profound aspects of it because it was so emblematic of what Balinese music or gamelan music in, in general was about, but it was that togetherness through breath. So that was really amazing. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I believe Jody has a question. If you'd like to jump on Jody. Uh, where's Jody? Well, she said, um, how do you I'm go here, about transcribing? I'm here, Oscar. Oh, hi, Jody. Yeah. I mean, um, that's quite a transcription job. I mean, you didn't, I'm just wondering <laughs> what, process is uh, to get all of those details so that we can look at them it took me over a year so that that it's definitely was a hell of a transcription job it, it was definitely helpful to have um, <coughs> its own score for the piece um, 
that clarified exactly how the uh, the Kotekan parts were split between the two players. Um, but this was this was Alet's score you were looking at. Yeah, yeah. So I, I can give you an example of it here. Actually, I've got it. This is an example of it. So it's it's fairly specific, thankfully. Um, but on top of that, yeah, I had to listen carefully to each part. And in uh, in Gen Four, in particular, I was you know listening to just one instrument, focusing on just that instrument to see what it was doing, which was very hard at times because the the texture is so busy that yeah, trying to <laughs> pull apart all of those parts is very difficult. But I, of course, I, I I slowed it down a little bit at times, and it was really really tricky. Um, and also I put it into Sonic Visualizer, which told me a fair bit about um, the tuning of the instruments, but I don't know about the tuning for sure. Um, it's, I just have fairly approximate um, measurements. Because I, I don't think um, uh, Sonic Visualizer has a way of, <laughs> to show, you know, the plumbang as opposed to the police tuning, so yeah. I don't, okay, I don't, know, I don't know what that is, but... Oh, it's just a computer program that you can visualize uh, audio files in various um, different ways. We were, we were talking the other day about the fact that all its score just has each part notated by itself. Oh it's yeah. The concept of an orchestral score. And I'm wondering if going back to the transmission, that's because he thinks of each part as something he gives to a person. So he's not yeah. thinking of it orchestrationally, but it's like as a set of interactions with the players. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, and yeah, I do think that yeah, he he composes each each uh, part of the piece in isolation from all the other parts of the piece. Um, and I don't know if that's related to the way that um, Balinese musicians think of music generally in sort of separate parts. But I hazard to say that they don't think of it like that. Um, and so yeah. The, the layering in this piece is is one of the extraordinary parts of it. Um, and I think, yeah, perhaps if you were thinking of it as a whole, it would have been too overwhelming to compose every note. You know, yeah, I think he's, he's thinking very linearly about sure. each part. Um, so the verticality perhaps isn't as important. I, I don't know. They're, they're still very rhythmically aligned, but... Um, but I don't think it matters what notes are being struck simultaneously. Sure, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Jody. All Any right. Questions? Yeah, we have a question from Putu. Oh, okay, cool. Hey, Putu. Hey, Oscar. Uh, can you hear me? Is it good? Yeah, yeah, can you? Yeah, yeah, awesome. This is this was amazing. Thank you so much for that. It was a great analysis you did and your own interpretation of. Genetic. Um, my question is concerning the, the title uh, specifically and in relation to um, how it's used quite literally, but also sort of as a metaphorical framework. Um, and I'm just thinking along the lines of, you know, when we think in defining genetics as like a sort of biological term, we're inevitably thinking about inherited traits that get passed on in some fashion. So I'm wondering if you have had any conversations with Pat Dewa about uh, the change in biology as it extends to like the biology of the instruments. And of course, as we can hear and as we can see in this context, the, there's all of these sort of legacies and inherited traits of past gamelan genres and repertoire right that he's literally sort of putting in in one piece and so to my ear it seems like it it's not so much uh paving the way or being an opening to more possibilities it's more because of the idea of like impermanence that like you can only play this or this piece has only been played once and really can't be replicated until another gamelan is made have you ever had conversations with him about sort of the biological aspects of genetic, genetic. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, you can, you, he definitely thinks a lot about um, older gamelan traditions and although his music, of course, doesn't really uh, 
always sound like those older traditions. He's, yeah, he's processing them at a very sort of fundamental level that is allowing him to, uh, yeah, recontextualize them, I think. And so, for example, in this section, although this is, I think, a rare occurrence in the entire work, um, this section, the, the rayon is playing like a trompong in Gong Luan style. So it's really, um, yeah, yeah, he, he's processing all these past traditions of gamelan in a really interesting way. I haven't talked so much about the, the, the way that the instruments design themselves relate to um, previous gamelans. I, I know that he was going for some practical things, like the instruments are quite a lot shorter than the normal gangsa instruments. They're, and that was just simply because it's easy to stack them on a truck and transport them around, right? So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question. Anyone else? Okay. Can I ask a question? Oh, yeah. Who's that? Lois. Go ahead, Lois. Uh, I'm, I would like to know whether this Alit is uh, related to the Alit who teaches uh, Balinese Gamelan at Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin. <laughs> uh, no, different, but they both they they both played in Suramani. <laughs> That's yes, and they both Adnyana. Yeah, and they're both from the same village. Yes, <laughs> but they're not related as okay. far as I know. Okay. Oh, cousins, cousins. Aya says they're cousins. Oh, okay. There you go. I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't think there's any more questions popping up in, in the chat box here. So thank you, Oscar. It's a wonderful Thanks presentation. So I encourage you, if everybody hasn't listened to the entire piece, I put the link in the chat box already to go to uh, Dewa, Dewa's uh, um, Bandcamp uh, page to check that out. Yeah, it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, it's totally <laughs> worth it. Minutes, it. Yeah, listen to it on your good speakers or your good headphones for sure. Um, next up is Michael Tenzer. Um, so Michael, let me just uh, ask you to start your video here.